Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Somo, and today we're going to study Psalm 19, one of the great Psalms in the Psalter. Now, before we get started, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we allow the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. <clears throat> Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this privilege and opportunity and all that you've provided so that we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive your truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 19. You know, sometimes I classify the psalm to tell you what kind it is. This one's a little hard to classify because it basically looks like two types because when you break it up into two different parts, it looks like it could be a praise psalm or a wisdom psalm. I'm going to conclude that it's a wisdom song and take the praise portion as wisdom we should learn. Well, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just follow along and I think you're going to benefit a great deal from learning this song. Let's look at a little outline. It only has 14 verses. The first six, one through six, the heavens declare the glory of God. Seven through 11, the psalm talks about the law of the Lord. And in 12 through 14, the psalmist reflects on himself or reflecting on oneself in light of the law. In other words, he looks at himself from what he's learned about the law. Now, verses 1 through 6, if you remember, you did the basic theories or uh, basic series of first things for children. We use these first six verses to explain the natural or sometimes we call it the general revelation of God and what we mean by that is is that God reveals himself in creation these first six verses has the reader that would be us to look at the heavens and we see in the heavens that is the stars our sun and moon the design of the heavens how it reveals the glory of God and we'll get into that in a moment the second part of the psalm talks about the law of God actually it calls it the law of the Lord notice they use the word Lord when it comes to the law and if you remember, Lord is the personal name of God. Actually, it's Yahweh. We usually say Yahweh. We're not sure that's the way to pronounce it. They used four letters without vowels, but they would pass on how it's pronounced. We didn't get that pronunciation passed on. So we fill in these vowels, Yahweh, from another way they pronounce it. Uh, they say Adonai. They don't even pronounce the word Lord because it's too holy. Well, the second half, we might say almost the second half, talks about the law. Now, remember, in the Old Testament, that would be the Mosaic law, the law that God gave Moses at Mount Sinai. So that's the rules, the regulations. That would include the, fe the festivals they were to follow, the sacrificial system, uh, the priesthood. They had the tabernacle, then they had the temple. Did you remember that? And so, what do we call the law of the Lord? Or we might call it the word of God. We call it special revelation. This is revelation that's given by God to his people through a special means, like a prophet, a priest, 
the written word of God. That's special revelation. Our greatest special revelation was Christ himself. He was special revelation from God to reveal God to us through his teachings and his works. His works. All right. Well, let's begin by looking at the first six verses where we see the heavens declaring the glory of God. Verse 1. The heavens are declaring the glory of God and the vast expanse proclaim the work of his hands. Notice the word declaring in the present tense. They continue to declare, to speak out about the glory of God. The glory of God here is a word or phrase that means we can see the power of God manifested or shown so when we look up at the heavens, we can see that it took great power. It took great power from God to create the heavens. So we see his glory. The next line kind of says the same thing, but uses different words. And that vast expanse, referring to the heavens, proclaim the work of his hands. The word for work here is interesting. It's what a skilled workman would do. Or an artist, if they were to create a great painting, it would be the result of that hard work that they would have a great painting to show. And notice it's of his hands, of God's hands. So what this verse tells us is that the heavens or the vast expanse, they constantly declare or announce to those people on earth, let's do it this way. The heavens, all right, they constantly announce to the people on earth the glory, the work of God. So when people go outside at night, look up at the stars, they see the design, the beauty, the order. Uh, if you know about the solar system, you've studied some science, you know that God has set each planet just right from the sun. And the earth is perfectly right so man can live on earth. It gives him warmth. It provides uh, daylight so we can walk around the daytime. It provides us night so we can rest. Do you ever think about that? God gave us day and night, day to do our work, night to rest. It's designed like that. And our bodies want to rest at night, doesn't, don't, doesn't it? Yes. So, the heavens declare the work of God, His perfect design in the universe, the stars and the planets, the sun and the moon, and the daytime. Verse 2 talks about the daytime. Look at this. Verse 2. Day after day, it, referring to the vast expanse of the heavens, pours out speech. And night after night, it, again, the vast expanse of the heavens, reveals knowledge. What this tells us is that day after day, day after day, every day, the heavens speak about God. And night after night, let me put it back up there, it reveals continuous action. It makes known knowledge about God. So to sum this up, day after day, night after night, every day, every night, the heavens, the people see the heavens, whether it's in the daytime, we see the sun and sometimes the moon. The movement, the governing of the stars and the planets, how they operate, they pour out words, unspoken words, to the senses of us human creatures that reveal something of the knowledge of God. What kind of knowledge? Well, first of all, 
the very fact that we see the stars and the moon and the sun, that they are there, they exist, that tells us that somebody had to put them there. Something had to put them there. Now, people who don't know God might say, well, how did that come about? And if they were to ask you that, you might say, well, God created them. And they might say, well, how could God, how could anything so great do that? He says, well, because God is great. How can anybody so smart? Because God is smart. He's intelligent. He's the creator. It's designed so well so we can live on earth. You know, the earth is just the right distance from the sun. Not too close to burn up, not too far away to freeze. It's just right to grow the plants. So we can have oxygen. So we can breathe. And you see, when people start to think about these things, they start to think about, boy, there must be a God. What about the power to create all these things? And then keep it running. You know, it's one thing to create something. It's another thing to keep it going. God does both. It speaks of his greatness. Many say that space is empty. It's not, is it? You look up. Billions of stars. We can't even see nearly all the stars. With great telescopes, we can see a lot more. We don't see all the planets and even all the other moons that circle other planets and how they work together. But we do know the sun provides us light and warmth. But all these things about the heavens we've been talking about, it's like it talks to us. That's the idea. It reveals knowledge about God. Look at verse 3 helps us better understand this. There is no actual speech or actual words, nor is there a voice actually heard. Now, I wrote the word actually in for us to understand this verse a little better. There are not real, literal, loud voices calling out from the heavens, are there? Of course not. But when people see something designed, they assume there's a designer. When my little girl, uh, who loves to draw, and she's quite good at it. She's not so little anymore. She's, uh, what is she, 15. She does some very good artwork. And when she leaves a piece laying in the living room, we can pick it up and say, well, Claire did that. She's the artist. She's the designer. She's the creator. She thought it up. She drew it, and then she painted it or colored it in somehow. We know that that piece of art came from a person. Just as people normally can look up and see the creation and say, there must be a creator. And what this verse 3 tells us is, though it doesn't speak out in words that we might hear with our ears, we can, with our minds, perceive that there's a creator. And we can even look on earth and see all the creation, how it works. Have you studied the water cycle yet? Or the, uh, I think some call it the oxygen cycle, how we get oxygen to breathe. And how God works through the, the sun to provide plants that produce oxygen. And, and they take in the carbon dioxide, what we breathe out. And then we look at creatures and how fascinating they are. Some big animals to the little insects and how they work and work and are designed to survive and, and live and sometimes benefit us and, and sometimes we know they eat each other up but see, they provide food for each other too. All in God's design. These things all speak about a creator. The intelligence to create them. The ability to design something. The ability to provide it food. You see, this is how the creation speaks to us on earth. Notice verse 4 continues on the same idea. Their voice has gone out throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. He has set up a tent for the sun in them. Now this is interesting about the sun and the tent, but let's look at the first part first. Their voice, now some of your translations, if you're looking at a Bible translation, may have the word 
line. Yes, it says their line. Well, that's because they probably left a letter out when they copied from the original. And you leave out the last letter on voice and the word is line. Like a measuring line, like a ruler. But I think they left out that letter, and it should say voice because that fits the context just perfectly. It says, their voice has gone out throughout all the earth. What the general revelation says goes worldwide. So everyone can see it. The person in the middle of Africa, or the Amazon forest, or the Arabian desert, or up in Siberia. You know where Siberia is in Asia? or in China, or in Central America, they can look up at night and see the stars in the heavens and see that it's magnificent. Thousands of stars that provide a little bit of light at night, but also shows that there's a God. And that voice rings out throughout the entire earth. Now let's look at this last line that has to do with the sun because this introduces us to the sun which is spoken about in the next couple of verses. He has set up a tent for the sun in them. Now how did God set up a tent for the sun? Well, the idea is the ancient, well, what did he do at night? Well, he went into his tent. In the morning, he'd come out of his tent in the daytime. So they have sort of the idea that God has sort of set up a tent. The sun goes into his tent at night and he comes out in the morning. Of course, we know he, come, he, he comes up on one side of the earth and, and goes out on the other side. So his tent must be on the other side, huh? But you see, they're just trying to draw some sort of analogy to how the sun works. He goes in at night and comes up in the morning. Verse 5 speaks more of the sun. It compares it to a newly married man, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. That's his bridal chamber, his bedroom. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. In other words, a man gets married, he has a wife, and he's very joyful about it. He rises up the morning and he says, I'm married, I can start a family, I have a woman of my own. And it's like a strong man who wants to run his course. That is, he feels strong and vigorous, uh, like a warrior who might go to, to war, or a strong man who might go out and, well, maybe he goes out and exercises or runs or rides a bicycle. He runs his course and is compared to the sun. Verse 6 talks about the course of the sun. It's rising from one end of the heavens, that's a horizon, it circuits to the other end. There is nothing hidden from its heat. If you think about it, uh, you may be able to live where you can see the rising of the sun on the horizon. Most of us have trees or buildings or, or maybe a mountains in the way. But if you could see the horizon in the morning, that's not a very good horizon, is it? Let's try that again. It should be more round. Well, anyway. All right, so we have the sun coming up. It starts to peep up, right, until it goes on up. All right, that's the rising on the horizon. You know, the best place to see this is on the ocean. Have you ever done that? Have you ever seen the sunset on the ocean or sunrise? Depends on which coast you're on or, or what part of the world you live in. If you don't live near the water, it couldn't help you much. But you can see the sun come up and then you so see it go down on the other side. And so what happens is, let's put this from another perspective. You see uh, from one end... Let's just do it this way. Let's say this is the world, and you're standing here. You see it come up on one side, right? It goes to the other side, right? It's not a very good example, is it? Basically, you see it circle. 
Now we know from our science that actually the sun doesn't cycle around like that. The earth actually rotates, doesn't it? So it appears like the sun comes up and the sun goes down. That's the idea. It rises from one end of the horizon all the way to the other end of the horizon. So, it circuits to the other end is what it says. And then it says, I like this line, there is nothing hidden from its heat. Nothing escapes the sun's warmth. Everything is touched by it. You know, even in cold weather when the sun comes up, you feel the sun. Have you ever done that? been out on a snowy cliff or maybe you like to ski and you and you feel that sun hit you. you gotta be careful you can get a sunburn out there as it reflects off the snow. Even the blind man feels the warmth of the sun. What is he feeling? He's feeling the warmth of creation, isn't he? Nothing is hidden from its heat. Well, that is the first six verses that discussed the uh, general or natural revelation of God. Now we moved into the next few verses, 7 through 11, which discusses the law of the Lord. Now, this is special revelation, and we're going to see that the psalmist uses six different words for the law. And then he uses six words to describe the law. And he's going to use four ways in which it affects a person. Six words for the law, six words to describe it, and four ways it affects us as people. Here we go. Verse 7. The first phrase he uses, or the first word he uses for the law, is the word for law. The law of the Lord is perfect. Notice, the law is perfect. It's God's high standard. And then we see the effect upon a person. It revives the life, or reviving the life. The word for life there is the one I want you to learn is nephish. The word basically means breath. Uh, it revives the breath of a person. You know, you couldn't live without breathing, right? Well, when you were born, you received breath. You received your spirit. And you became alive. So sometimes we translate the word nephish as life or person or self. Um, it's who you are. It revives your life. How does the law of the Lord revive your life? Well, if you're down, if you're depressed, if you're not doing well spiritually, you get into the Word and it can revive you. You see God's truth. It picks you up. You start applying it. Or maybe you're, you've been sinful and you are being disciplined. Hopefully that's not happening, but it happens to all of us. And you're being disciplined, and you decide to confess your sin and get back with God and, and study His Word. And by the way, this tells us how important the Word of God is in our life. I'm telling you, if you're not getting the Word on a regular basis, either from church or your parents or some Bible teacher, you can't grow as a Christian. You can't have your life revived when you fail or you're in trouble. To be revived also means to be restored. Um, if you are going through difficult divine discipline because you decide not to confess your sin and you decide you want to just stay sinful, stay disobedient, you disobeyed your parents, you lied to them, you continue to do that, Let's say you don't straighten it out with the Lord or your parents for a whole week. You may find yourself 
being very unhappy. You might even find yourself sick. Nothing seems to be working for you. And then you wake up and realize, you know, I need to confess my sin. I need to get right with my parents, but most of all with God. So you go apologize to your parents. You confess your sin to God. That's the main thing. Let his spirit start controlling you again, and you are revived. That's the idea here. The next two lines, the testimony of the Lord, notice another name for the law. The testimony of the Lord is reliable. Right? Making wise the simple. Notice, it makes wise the simple. That's the effect it has on a person. The word for testimony, we've probably seen that word many times if you study with me much. That's basically what someone says. The testimony of the Lord is is reliable. There's another word describing God's law. Reliable. It's dependable. Alright? Making wise the simple. Let's talk about that for a moment. Who's the simple person? Let's talk about being simple. Usually, when people think of someone being simple, they think of him being a youth not very experienced, hasn't lived very long, doesn't know a, a whole lot, okay? But you know an older person can be simple also. He's not learned what he should. What the Bible is telling us here is that if we learn the Word of God, we learn the testimony of the Lord, we can become wise and we don't make those mistakes. We make wise decisions. You can be 15 years old and be wise in certain areas. Uh, when you're 15 you need to be wise about uh, the opposite sex. You need to know about uh, peer pressure. You need to know about uh, what's right and wrong in very difficult situations. If you see everybody cheating that doesn't mean you should, right? So the testimony of the Lord, what the the word of the Lord tells us is reliable. It makes wise the simple. <clears throat> Let's look at verse 7 and 8 together. We just did 7. We're going to tie them in together here. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the life. The testimony of the Lord is reliable, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, making happy the heart. The command of the Lord is pure enlightening the eyes. Let's talk about verse 8 now. The precepts of the Lord are right. The precepts, another word for the law, it means instruction, are right. You know what right means. It's the right thing. It tells you the right thing to do. The effect, it makes happy the heart. If you want to be happy, you want to rejoice in life, you want to be glad, you want to be a happy person, then basic happiness comes from the believer who regularly learns, believes, applies the Word of God. These are the right things to do. It tells us the right things to think, the right things to say. And when you do that as a Christian, when you're regularly learning the Word, you have a happiness that the world doesn't have. Oh yeah, they have fun, and they have occasions where they say they're happy, happy. But you know what? You want true, deep enjoyment in life? You live by the Word of God. You see, when you do that, you line up with your Creator. Special revelation gives us guidance in how to not only please God, but do the right thing, and it brings us joy. <clears throat> the second pair of lines, notice another word for the law. Up in the first part of the verse, it was precepts. The second part, it's the command. The command of the Lord is pure. It's clean. It's the right thing to do. Again. 
Notice also, it enlightens the eyes. It gives us insight. The word for enlighten is the word light. It gives us the light on things. So we know what to do. Don't you wish you knew what to do sometime and you didn't? Well, we don't always know what to do. But if we know the Word of God, sometimes we know to be patient or to wait. Then when we see the right thing to do, we do it. Or we don't do the wrong thing. You might know, uh, not know what to do in some cases, but you know lots of things that you're not supposed to do, right? Notice the next line, or the last two lines again. The command of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. You have the pure instruction of the Word of God. You have the commands of the Word of God. The right instruction, the precepts, the pure commands to make you happy and give you insight into life. Verse 9. The commands to fear the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are altogether righteous. Now this verse 9 gives us another term for the law, but this time it calls it the fear of the Lord. The idea is the commands that tell us to fear the Lord. All right? They're clean, and they endure forever. Let's talk about the fear of the Lord first. This is something we've studied in Proverbs, if you studied Proverbs with me, but it's a basic teaching in Proverbs, an important teaching. Let me go through a list here of some of the ways in which the fear of the Lord benefits us as believers. All right? Proverbs 1, 7. A, that means the first part of the verse. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. That's 813A. 910A, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Let's continue here. 1027a, the fear of the Lord prolongs life. 1427a, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. It gives you a good life. 166b, and by the fear of the Lord, one keeps away from evil. 1923a, the fear of the Lord leads to life similar to what we just saw. Then we get the whole whole verse in 22.4, the reward of humility and fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. 23.17, do not let your heart envy sinners, but live in the fear of the Lord always. Fear of the Lord means to so respect and revere God that you obey God. The fear of the Lord, you get all these benefits. And that's from Proverbs, the book of wisdom. Let's look at verse 9 again. The commands to fear the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are altogether righteous. Notice these commands to fear the Lord endure forever. That means they stand permanently. They're always true. The judgments of the Lord are true. The judgments are his decisions. The things that God has decided. You know, God decided to put the universe in place. He decided to create you, let you be alive. He decided where you would live, who your parents would be, and so on. Uh, when it comes to the word of God, they're all true. Everything the Word of God says is true, faithful, reliable. And then he kind of sums it up when he says they are altogether righteous. So the commands and the decisions the Lord has made for us, revealed in his Word, guide us in this world. 
They provide us the guidance we need to benefit the most out of this planet that he created. And verse 9 tells us they are altogether righteous. They're entirely righteous. In verse 10, we see how the law is better than what the world offers. Listen to this one. They are more desirable than gold, than much gold, than honey, and the drippings of the honeycomb. You know, in the ancient world, and we know this even today, people desire things like gold, riches. The law of the Lord with all the different names we saw and the different ways it's described. It's reliable, it's pure, it's clean, it's true. It's more valuable than gold, than a lot of gold. More valuable than any precious thing on earth. And then it's compared to honey. The drippings of the honeycomb, the sweetest part, the sweetness of honey is analogous to the benefits and pleasure the Word of God brings us. You want pleasure in life? Know the Word of God. Apply the Word of God. More valuable than gold, more pleasure than what the sweetness of honey can bring us. I like honey. I like it on my biscuits, sometimes my toast. Verse 11. Now, <clears throat> listen to what it does for those who serve God Psalm 1911 also your servant is warned by them and keeping them there is great reward this tells us that those who live by the word of God are warned of all the traps and the snares of the world of the flesh and the devil. You ever walked into a trap? Well, you probably haven't walked into an animal trap, but you don't want to do that. But there are many traps out there for human beings too. Often evil people set them so that we might waste our money or our time or even get hurt. Wisdom we learn from the Word of God that keeps us from being simple, helps us avoid the traps of this world. Also, the benefit, the more positive benefit on the positive side is that there's reward. For those of us who live by the Word of God, there is a basic reward. We get a benefit in life that the world doesn't get because the Word of God gives us the best possible guidance to live in this world. And so that we have a satisfaction about life as we know we're doing the right thing before God. Isn't there a pleasure in doing the right thing? As you mature as a Christian and you continue to do the right thing over and over again, we learn that there's reward in doing the right thing. Not only in this life, but in the life to come. Sometimes there is reward for doing things that we do as we grow spiritually. We make right choices. We learn what our spiritual gifts are and start to use them. And we get reward for doing the right thing and using our spiritual gifts. And that's because we've learned the Word of God and we've believed it and we're constantly applying it when we make our decisions. Now as we come to our last few verses, we really change gears here, you might say where the psalmist reflects on himself. We put it here, reflecting on oneself in light of the law. So what we see here is that the psalmist begins to look at himself, compare his life, what he thinks, what he says, and what he does, and finds himself 
sometimes not doing the right thing. So what he knows he has to do is rely upon the Lord's mercy. That God will grant him mercy. Let's look at this. Verse 12. Now he's looking at himself, remember that, when he says, Who can discern errors? He's talking to the Lord. Do not punish me for hidden things. When he says, Who can discern errors? He's making this statement that applies to himself. I can't get everything right. I can't sort out everything. There are things I don't know about. And he asks God not to punish, punish him for the things he doesn't know about, like the hidden things. You know, sometimes we do something wrong, and we didn't even know it was wrong, right? Don't, doesn't that happen? That's the idea here. When he does things that are out of line with God, he doesn't know about them. Let me give you a good example. Someone tells you something that you believe, and that person didn't know that they actually lied to you. They say, you know, so-and-so left town for a couple of weeks because that person told them that they left or were going to leave. But later you find out they never left. Well, that friend of yours told you that that person had left, and they didn't. So he did not know he lied, did he? It was unintentional. Of course it was. He didn't mean to lie. He thought he was telling you the truth. But you know, when we lie and don't know it, it's still a lie. That's right. And what he's asking here, the psalmist is asking, God, don't punish me for the things I didn't know of. Sometimes we sin and didn't know it was a sin. Like I just gave you an example of. So the psalmist realizes he doesn't know everything. He's not going to do everything right. And we need to understand that too. We don't know everything. We're not going to do everything. We have a lot to learn, don't we? I have a lot to learn. We all do. And here's the point. Let me put it up on the board for you. The psalmist openly admits he does not know or discern enough to keep himself from errors of violating the perfect ways of the Lord. And he asks that the Lord not discipline him for his shortcomings done in ignorance. Now look at this again. He admits that he doesn't know everything. He admits that he's going to make errors of things he didn't know about. And that violates God's perfect ways. And he asks God for his mercy, that's what he's doing, to not discipline him for things he does in ignorance. Now, let me write down a word that I want you to understand. This psalmist is showing one of the great characteristics of great men and women, of great kids, humility. He's willing to admit his shortcomings in pleasing God in every area of his life. And when he asks for God not to punish him, he's asking for mercy. And by the way, God wants us to ask for mercy. God wants us to be humble. God gives grace to the humble. Basic teaching in Scripture. He gives grace to the humble. We recognize that we're not perfect and we keep going to God. Telling God that we're not perfect and that we need His help. So two great characteristics of a growing Christian is humility and asking for mercy. You know the greatest Christians need mercy. The greatest Christians need grace. We, not, we need God to forgive us. And if we miss something or we don't know something and we sin or we hurt people, we didn't know we were hurting them, we need God's mercy. We go apologize to the person, and then we tell God, we didn't know that. God knows you didn't know. He knows everything, right? 
then we ask for his mercy and just wait for him to give it. Because we have a very merciful and gracious God. Now, that verse covered things that we were ignorant of. But what about when we do things that we really wanted to do and we know they're sinful? Yes, we do that too. Look at verse 13. And also, or also, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not control me. Then I will be complete or blameless and not punished from or because of great transgressions. What does this mean? Let's talk about presumptuous. Maybe a word you're not familiar with. Presumptuous is something someone assumes or thinks about someone or themselves, for example. Usually, it comes from arrogance or pride. So, you're proud, sinfully proud. You think you know it all. You think you're the best. And so, what do you do? You make someone else look bad by lying about them. Okay? You lie. Or you want to make yourself look good? You lie. I'm the one who did that. These are sins from pride. This is being presumptuous. Maybe you think you know something about people that you really don't. And you make judgments. And you may say things that aren't true about them. That's presumptuous sins. But you know you do it. And that's the idea here. You intentionally, you know it's a sin, you're proudful, and you decide to do it anyway. Well, let me tell you this. I don't think so, this will be a shock to you, but we all do that too. So the psalmist is admitting not only does he do presumptuous sins, but he tells God to keep him from doing them. And then he has a very important line next. Let me just put it down below. I want to underline it first, and then I'll show it to you. Verse 13. Let them not control me. This means to rule or control. Sin can control our lives. It's the sin nature. We've learned about that in First thing series that the sin nature can control us if we allow it. That's when, why we need to confess our sins and give ourselves over to the Holy Spirit. Look at the first two lines again. Also keep your servant from presumptuous, that's sins from pride, from presumptuous sins. Let them not control me. Don't let sin control your life. When we give ourselves over to sin, it controls us. And how do we get out of it? We confess it and give ourselves back to the Spirit. Just like we do before every Bible study. If we haven't already, we need to do it then. So we can get the most of our study, right? Notice, if we avoid that, third line, then I'll be complete. I'll be blameless and not be punished. And not punished from great transgressions. If you avoid those presumptuous sins and don't let sin control you, then you'll be blameless before God and not be punished, not receive divine discipline. Very important that we go to God to give us strength to avoid sin. It's very important. So let's look at these last two verses together. Who can discern errors? Do not punish me for hidden things. Also keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Sins done on purpose. Let them not control me. Then I will be complete and not punished from great transgressions or because of great transgressions. Now let's talk about some application. But let's do it from a New Testament perspective because this is Old Testament. And though it's true, we have additional help 
as New Testament believers. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit, which means we have his power. We have all the Bible now, not just the Old Testament. We have the New Testament too. And we need to realize, just like this psalmist does, that none of us are perfect. None of us can meet the high standards of God just perfectly. We still live in these earthly bodies that have the sin nature. And sometimes it will control, and sometimes we let it control. We still have our lusts for things. We lust with the eyes. We lust for people. And tendencies to be proud. That's when we lie. Or we cheat. Or we think we're so good we don't have to be totally honest. We may exaggerate to make ourselves look good. Or we may exaggerate to make others look bad. Exaggeration is often a lie. Depends why you do it. You know, if you say that's the best, that's the best home run I've ever seen, well, is that really the very, very best? But if we tell that someone did something they didn't, we do it out of pride. That's a lie. It's a pretty big sin. That's presumption. Here's something we should learn. Look on the board. We need God's help all the time. God knows that. And that is one reason we have the Spirit and His power to give us that help. You know, sometimes we just need to admit that they're weak, that we are weak, and that we're ignorant of many things, and we need God's help. We need His Word, His wisdom. We need His power and His strength. And these two verses show us the humility of the psalmist, and we should be like that too. We should constantly acknowledge, constantly acknowledge we need God's help. Now let me just tell you something that you probably already know. But it's true of all of us. We're all sinners. We're still going to sin. Sometimes out of ignorance. We didn't know it was a sin. Sometimes out of presumption. We do it on purpose because we give in to our lust and want the sin nature to control and we want to please it. None of this catches God by surprise. He's made provision for our recovery. And when we fail, and we often do daily, many times, we throw ourselves back upon the mercy of God. We confess our sin and get back right with Him. Now listen, the moment we think we're too smart or too good or too self-disciplined to not fail is the moment we get proud and are failing. Read that again on the board. The moment we think we're too smart or too good or too disciplined, self-disciplined, not to fail is the moment we are proud, we get proud and are failing. Very important lesson here at the end of this psalm is what we just saw. Humility and realizing we're sinners, we're going to sin, Sometimes out of ignorance, sometimes we're going to choose to. Finally, verse 14 comes back to where the psalmist closes with prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Notice the words of my mouth, what he says. The meditation of my heart. What he thinks. Two areas of sin. He addresses the sins of the tongue. And the sins of the heart. The sins of the mind. Sins of thoughts. He wants them acceptable to the Lord. He wants that area cleaned up in his life. To be acceptable means to be pleasing to God, like a sacrifice. Sacrifices were supposed to please God, but one had to have the right attitude about it. 
Romans, if you studied Romans with me, you know that we're to offer our bodies up to God as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to Him. And then he closes with this last line. I'm just going to put it up there by itself. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The rock is the place of refuge. We studied that several times in Psalm 18. Remember, it's that cliff rock, the safe place up there in the side of the mountain where no one can get to you easily. They might not even know you're there. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The redeemer is the person, uh, the member of the family who can reach out to help another member of the family because he has the resources to do so. If you've ever been in a disaster with your family and you have to leave the area, you may want to have a family member that will help you, that will open up their home. In a sense, he is the redeemer for that time. In the ancient world, though, they had someone who was like one of the members who had the resources to help. We see this in the book of Ruth. Okay? So that we find that the Lord is always our Redeemer. Not only our place of refuge, but He's our source of help in time of need. Let's put the final point up there so you can read it. The psalmist acknowledges his propensity. Now that's a big long word that means he has a tendency to do it. All right, that's kind of the way he leans all the time. He has a, he's going to sin sometimes in every major area of life. He asks for God's mercy and discipline and power to keep from sinning that he might live blameless before the Lord. Then finally, the Lord is his rock and redeemer. He is the only one who can be his refuge and his help. In time and need. Let's close by reading through our psalm. By now we should have a lot of the meaning understood. Psalm 19. For the choir director, a psalm of David. The heavens are declaring the glory of God, and the vast expanse proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day it pours out speech, and night after night it reveals knowledge. There is no actual speech or actual words, nor is there a voice actually heard. Their voice has gone out throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. He has set up a tent for the sun in them, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. It rises from one end of the heavens, its circuit to the other end. There is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the life. The testimony of the Lord is reliable, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, making happy the heart. The command of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than much gold, than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Also your servant is warned by them. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern errors? Do not punish me for hidden things. Also keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not control me. Then I will be complete and not punish from great transgressions. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock, and my Redeemer. Well, I told you it was a great psalm. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great word of yours today, how we've learned it is pure, it is righteous. We've learned how you reveal yourself from the heavens, from creation. Lord, we also learned that we need to be hum humble, that we need your mercy. Challenge us with the things we've Learn today, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen.